Direct from the White House to Dan York's State of Mind. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. There's no question when it comes to running the show his own way, the sheriff from Bristol County, Mass., has been doing that for quite some time. He recently was in Washington uh, to applaud the president's signing of, well, the veto, the first ever veto from the, from, from the president on, on this border wall thing. And I'm looking forward to it. I've always been kind of a fan of the, of, of the sheriff. Uh, he knows I'm not a fan of the president, so this is going to be a really interesting conversation, uh, no doubt. Welcome aboard. Great to have you in. Let me just uh, touch base on a couple of things that are happening here in town. Um, at the ceremony earlier today for the introduction of the new education commissioner here in Rhode Island, and there's no doubt in my mind that she comes with a resume that certainly qualifies her to be a conversation about this piece, this position. Angelica Infante Green was introduced by the governor today. I'm very excited about this opportunity, but I'm excited for all of us. This is a moment that we all have to capture. This is a moment that I feel that we are going to work together. But I want to take this time for you to get to know me a little better, so you know who will be working with you, who will be your champion, and who you will come and have as the person that will fight for your children. It's a sentiment that I think that I think is 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 one that resonates. It's a common ground sentiment. She celebrated the idea that she was uh, the first Latina uh, commissioner of education. And look, I, I, that's the way the world works right now, and it's natural. Uh, the Latino population in general uh, has felt like they have been <laughs> cast aside. Obviously, there's a lot of mixed messaging going on out there. We've got some immigration conversation, which we're going to have today, uh, that mixes in. Uh, but, but clearly, uh, she did a good job today of, of saying that she was going to be there for everybody. These are cliches and things you've got to say, but you better make the commentary, because if you don't, you're setting an agenda that's going to look a little bit uh, narrow, right? Point is, the right cast testing was a disaster. Uh, MCAS testing, so far ahead of RICAS testing, it's, it's embarrassing to the state of Rhode Island. So steady course and doing the right things for the next 20 years will get us there. Unfortunately, we still don't have a foundation to do the right things. And uh, that's got to be clear. The other thing is, is that when you, when you make an appointment like this, as the governor has done, you've got to create some level of process and transparency. The governor told us today that she talked to a half a dozen or so candidates, wouldn't name them. There was no competition like there was in Massachusetts. There's no public discussion for qualifying. Here's the, here's the thing that insults me and everybody else. There's a process now where the State Board of Election and the Secondary uh, uh, Board are, are going to interview her. The pomp and circumstance for today's announcement makes that all perfunctory. And, 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 and so, and, and you know what? They just don't get it. And you know what? They don't want to get it. And I'd respect the governor more if she just said, you know, hell with it. We're in trouble, I'm leading, and I'm breaking up the process. Instead, she just kind of dances around the whole situation. Not good. And this new commissioner should come in with a consensus as opposed to a who is she. But I wish her well. She seems really sharp, and we're going to give her all the benefit of the doubt here. All right. Um, Warwick, real quick, before we get to this subject matter for tonight. Uh, Warwick firefighter pensions, real big problem. All these side agreements, the feds are in Warwick, you know, looking at this whole thing. It's a doggone mess. And we learned today from a story in the Providence Journal that even the mayor is putting his big point pants on and is deciding to actually take on the issue and maybe provide some accountability for the Abidjan administration. You've seen the mayor and the... Uh, uh, there he is, good Mayor Solomon, uh, who has not really stepped up. There's Steve Marola, the city council president, uh, who has stepped up and said, look, the previous administration really kind of did this wrong here. Uh, they were scheduled for a 2 o'clock press conference today. Obviously, you see the show at 7.30 at midnight. I taped the show in the early afternoon, so i got to catch up to that. But we'll have some conversation about whether or not there's finally some 
truth-telling going on in the city of Warwick about what has happened, because if you don't do that, you can't tell us about what's going to happen. It's actually pretty simple. All right, the border, the veto. Let me recap what happened last week, and we shall bring on our esteemed guests. Congress has the freedom to pass this resolution, and I have the duty to veto it. The president's first veto came after Congress rejected the national emergency he declared last month in order to get funds for the long-stalled southern border wall. The joint resolution is passed. The resolution's passage was a rare instance of Senate Republicans breaking insignificant numbers with the president on an issue central to his administration. Or this declaration is a dangerous precedent. They argued future Democratic presidents could misuse their power to declare a national emergency. For me, this is a constitutional question. It's a question about the balance of power that is core to our Constitution. Congress does not have enough votes to override the veto, though House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said today the House would try later this month. It is a tremendous national emergency. It is the president said wall construction would go ahead. But legal challenges could delay it for years. We have many miles under construction right now, and we're going to be signing contracts over the next couple of days for literally hundreds of miles of wall. After campaigning on a promise that Mexico would pay for the wall, the president will now redirect funds from U.S. military construction projects to pay for it. You know, I have a lot more respect for guys like this guy than I do for that guy, because that guy was given a little whisper in his ear about a campaign thing he ought to pull off at the start, and it kind of caught fire. You, at least legitimately, have been talking about these issues for a long time. Welcome. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. The, uh, uh, the long tenure of your sheriffdom has been highlighted by your outspoken style and your conversation about immigration issues. I mean, they certainly precede this president, do they not? Yeah, they go back uh, about 20 years. Yeah, so overall, before we talk about the president, the veto, the current wall battle, all of that kind of a thing. What is your overall perspective on this illegal immigration thing these days? Well, we're in a crisis. There's no question about it um, in, on many fronts. But importantly, 20, I remember almost 20 years ago, I was working on a bipartisan bill with Barney Frank and Henry Hyde. Uh, and I was down in Washington, and I recall going over to Senator Kerry's office after it passed the House and saying, we've got to get this thing through. Um, and I remember uh, distinctly the person saying to me, it's not going to happen, just like that. And I said, what do you mean it's not going to happen? It just passed the House. It's an election year. It's not going to see the light of day. And I never forgot that because every year thereafter on immigration issues, there was always a new excuse. And I realized very quickly that this was really not about the people. This was about politics. And if ever there was a time for people to see that, it's now. Um, we kept, kept telling Congress, I've testified before the Judiciary Committee a couple of times on this issue down in Washington. We've told them time and, again, and time again, our communities are deteriorating. The drugs are, are pouring in. We have gangs coming into our communities and on and on and on. People are dying. Uh, we have hundreds of angel moms and dads now. And, um, and it's only got progressively worse. And Congress every year has turned a blind eye and a deaf ear. So we're at a point now where one person, the President of the United States, has been the only person that the others listened, but he's the only one that's taken action. And he's taken the right action, and that's why the sheriffs, our federal, state, and local partners, are, are standing in support of the President, saying, look, we've been asking and asking for this. You've listened to us. The others heard us, listened to us, but you're the only one that decided to take steps to Correct. Well, specifically, what is the crisis? I mean, listen, you just, you just talked to me about a couple elements of, of, of the crisis, but, but in a sentence, what is the crisis? Well, the crisis is... Um, I'll give you a paragraph. Uh, that that, that would sentence. be easier. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, the, the, the people coming to the border, I mean, we have mothers uh, handing off their children before, to, to the coyotes from the drug cartels and paying them five to $7,000 to get to the border. But the mothers are giving their daughters, their teenage daughter, birth control pills because they know they're gonna get raped at least once. Uh, they get to our border, they're pushed off into communities all over the, all over the United States, and um, they don't have any family support. And there's all kinds of humanitarian crisis. The disease, they have 285 people right now at the Aurora, Colorado uh, site, 
where um, they're quarantined because of measles, mumps, and um, uh, one other contagious disease. And they can only hold those, those, those people for 20 days. So if you're there 10 days and you get diagnosed with mumps or measles or what have you, you're only gonna get 10 days of treatment when you need 25. So when you're for, they're forced to be released after 10 days, they're going into your neighborhood, mine, and everywhere else with the rest of their medication for, for 15 days and instructions to use it. All right, uh, when we come back, we'll talk about what immigration reform should look like. Is it all just about a wall? Stay with us. Mr. President, you are the first person who's taken action. And you have given us back our footing in law enforcement, but you've also given the American people back what they deserve, which is to be protected. And signing this today, I can't tell you how much it means to all of us in law enforcement. Last week, the sheriff uh, with the president, first time you've worked with him or no, been in his been, presence? No, I've been there several times. Uh, your take on his approach is what? Uh, he's, a, he's, he's strictly a businessman, a problem solver. Uh, focused on how do we fix this, tell me what we need to do. He talks to the, the people that have their boots on the ground, depending on what the topic is. Um, he's even met with, in this case, he's met with the angel moms and dads uh, on numerous occasions to understand what's transpired in their lives and how that happened. And, um, and he's really looked at the whole essence of the problem. And I've been in a number of roundtables with him. He wants to know about, as I had mentioned uh, before, about the, the idea that parents are mothers are handing off their, their teenage daughters and giving them birth control pills because they're going to get raped along the way. From 36,000 feet, listen, you're working in an environment where, where the criminals are, are housed, maintained. Uh, you have an interesting uh, way of, of, of running uh, your correctional facility. Um, you've always had kind of an outside the box perspective on, on how to handle those things. Uh, I have no doubt that this problem is real. I think most Americans understand this problem is real. Somehow we got to get to a solution. And whereas years ago, you might have been told that nothing would be done because it was a political season, uh, the one thing the president might have done, purposely or inadvertently, is bring the conversation to a higher, a higher peak, no doubt. The country is, is trying to figure this thing out. Uh, the process by which he's done it, care to weigh in, or do you not care about it? In other words, raking money where money shouldn't be raked, constitutional controversy at minimum. Uh, he couldn't win the day with his own party to get this thing done when he had the opportunity and now it's nothing but antagonism and not necessarily working out of the box but perhaps working out of the constitutional structure. Well, I'm not sure. I, I was in the Oval Office uh, during the signing and, and uh, the new Attorney General said he's fully within his authority legally to do this. Um, I guess that may remain Gee, to be seen. I'm, I'm, I'm so surprised that the new Attorney General has that perspective. Yeah, he does. Yeah, well, no, the, the, there would be no new Attorney General without that perspective. Well, there's no grass growing under your feet. Yeah, and and, and and I, but I think when you make a public statement like that, you have to be able to back it up. And I think he probably would not have done that if he didn't think that it was going to be defensible, particularly early on. But but we'll see in, in the end. But I think the bigger point is what we should be looking at is why for 20 years Congress turned a blind eye, deaf ear, knowing people were dying and continue to know how bad it's gotten with the opioid crisis. Uh, we have a mother in Massachusetts who said, I encourage my son to come over and shoot up in front of me because he's all I have and I don't want him to die. And, and, and we had a double overdose where a mother uh, and father were laying on the floor in the living room, foaming at the mouth, with the three-year-old sitting next to the mother crying, trying to wake her up, and the five-year-old sitting next to her. These are real situations that are going on all over the country. The president gets it, and he's drilled down into our neighborhoods. And I think what's important to ask is not so much whether or not the president had the right to take this step on the, on the uh, emergency uh, effort, but more importantly, how did he get there? He asked them, Republicans and Democrats, by the way, I'm not picking on Democrats, I'm saying both. To fund the wall, this is what the American people need. We know it. It's been a growing problem. All the experts have said it. And you all continue to use the legislative branch in Washington as your political playground. Mm -hmm. And I, I grew up down there. I've watched them for years. I've been immersed in this issue. And believe me, I'm as frustrated, maybe even more frustrated than most people, having seen how sadly they've ignored what's going on and hurt the American people, who they promised to protect. And the fact that they're undermining us in law enforcement who are trying to keep our promise. I said to the angel moms at a press conference there, asked me to speak, and I said, 
I'm sad to be staying here, standing here because I, I can't understand how the depth of your loss, but I'm sad for your loss. But more importantly, not equally imp as important, I'm sad because we promised to protect you and we couldn't. Well, now there's a, there's a dispute as to how to protect, right? Uh, I, every day uh, in, in 2016, 17, and 18, maybe less now because there's a little bit more candor even coming from the president about what he actually wants to build here or can build with the money he's legitimately asked for. It's hundreds of miles of wall. This is notion amongst the constituency that this is the wall of China that we are going to have here. In the political yeah. environment, sure. it was way hyperbolized. So we haven't done a very good job of informing and being intellectually honest on both sides of the aisle as to what was being asked for. I, I think the Democrats made a big mistake in not, in not, in not ceding to the president uh, literally at the State of the Union when he more or less talked about barriers. Uh, they should have called it victory. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for calming down. We're going to give you a couple hundred miles of what you need in the strategic places that you're suggesting we should. And we're going to high-tech the living daylights out of this whole thing. That would have been the right thing to do. Instead, the antagonism continued, and we've got what we have. You don't want to see 1,700 miles of new wall this high, like the Wall of China, do you? No, I've been to Israel. I've seen, I've been to all three borders in Israel. I've been saying for a long time we need to model Israel's model. It isn't all, it, it's, there's fencing, but there's also high-tech things. There's, there, there are observation stations. It's a combination, and the president knows that, too. Well, the president's been a moving uh, target art, art, on his articulation of this thing. He got off the wall, he got into a barrier, and then he went back to the wall. The guys, the, you know, in as much as you're suggesting that he's a business guy, he sees it clearly, he's a problem solver, he is a, he is a, 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 a message mess. He has not been consistent on this. And so I would hope that somebody who, is in, who, 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 has take, who has carved out a consistent stake like you have, that you too would also suggest to the president that he better get his message straight. Because well, leading is about message straight. Oh, yeah, it, it, and it's, it's clearly a, messaging is important. What I would say is I, I have a little bit different take. He changed from the term wall because people were starting to look at it, as you said, Dan, as a sort of China wall. And, and, and that wasn't ever his intention. He never meant it that way. Um, and he, went to, he started talking about slats. Um, and he started talking about slats because um, he was told, look, if they're going to object to the wall and slats work as well and you can see through them, then that's fine. Whatever it is, but we're going to have some barrier there. Sure, if there wasn't a MAGA rally that he didn't talk about a big wall. Oh, sure. He created an impression amongst the electorate in this country that we were going that route. That's not honest. And well, that's not how you win an argument. That's, I, I suppose people could feel that way. I would say it's saying wall, regardless of construction, whether it's uh, concrete or whether it's metal slats or what have you, I, th I think what he was trying to get across, and wall was the easiest term to use, not meaning to say it's the wall of China, but to say we're going to put a barrier here that these people aren't going to be able to get over. He could have said we're going to put a slotted uh, and, and the fence. technology that has to support that structure, correct? Well, yeah, but that's always been. That's, that's always but the Democrats have continued to say, we'll support that. Their politics are that we're going to be the anti-wall. He's going to be the big wall. And somewhere in the middle sure. is, is the truth. Yeah. I, and I think guys like you who have, what's the word I want to use, equity in this argument, ought to start doing that. Yeah, I have been. Uh, I've been talking about. It. I've been talking about it long before this issue of the wall came up. That we needed to have this. Follow the model of the, the Israelis. They have sensors on the ground. They've got. They've got the barrier, uh, but they have two barriers. They've got a no man's zone in between. They've also got. Uh, they've got balloons that float in the air. Uh, that have radio technology in there and all kinds of satellite things and so forth. So. We don't have to recreate the wheel, and, I, and the president understands that. I think that he was trying to make sure that people understood the image of people are coming across, and we've got to stop them from being able to get in. I, I mean, I have to admit, I might have used the term wall myself. I might have said, look, we, you know, we need to build a wall. Most of us, right? It, imagine if you said to the people of this country, you cannot, in, in Providence, you're not, the, the code is now that you can't have a wall around your house, right? Well, People have fences, but yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's more meant to be a barrier, I suppose, but I hear your point. Um, no, it I can just, be confusing. Well, we, and, and, you know, we, we ought to talk about a way to, 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 to end the confusion. Sure, I agree. And we'll talk about how we do that when we come back. 
By the way, if it gets too expensive, sheriff has got a few inmates he'd like to lend this whole thing. Is that still is that still that all your ideas? Been on the table. Well, have it, you it, talked to the inmates about that? By the way, you know, actually, I had two inmates who were being released, and they and they said, "Listen, we're getting released in a couple of days, but if you if they want us to go down there and build it, I, we'll go down with them and help build that wall." Uh, these are inmates that would volunteer, and it wasn't just ours. I, I was offering it nationally, so ours may not have gone. It may have been inmates that were closer, just like the pipes in Michigan. Well, listen, we, we, yet. right? Well, we we have uh, we have had successful programs where inmates have done good community work. You know, cleaning the highways is one of them, right? I'm sure that's happening in, in Bristol County, Mass, as well. Uh, <laughs> but but you know, that's where I think headlines and a lack of depth confuse the conversation right uh, if you're actually if you actually think that that's a constructive plan uh, I, I would imagine you've got to be in consensus of sheriffs all across the country and, and or correctional facilities all across the country because we have different models and different sure. states, right um, and lay that out and by the way what is their expertise and what is their application to actually getting work done on a federal level that's a morass I'm not I'm not exactly sure how that works well, were, were you being more figurative or, or, or do you actually think this is a specific proposal that needs the light of day? Oh, I think I think anywhere we can cut taxpayers' money and allow inmates to have an opportunity to get involved in a national initiative, much like laying the pipes in Michigan, if they can't get it done for two years because they don't have the money, why wouldn't you allow inmates to go in and do something, give people cleaner water much faster? We built it we, at, at the IDDI school, which is a head trauma residence facility. We had inmates spend six months building a treehouse handicapped accessible treehouse that was magnificent that you would have thought the house came right out of uh, uh, um, Hansel and Gretel or something. It was it was amazing. And these are people that never would have seen the world from that perspective. Do you say these things because, because your intimacy with your correctional population um, makes you bullish on what these people can do once they leave? Yeah, you know... Is that... Is that because, you know, you're one of these guys that's really interesting. You know, you know, I've only met a couple times and had a few conversations. But I find that you're, the bluster of you and the reporting of you is, is, is much more um, theatrical than the conversation with you. Yeah, I can't control how, how media... Portray. You know what I'm saying, right? I, I think so, but but see, I just I, want to know if these are really practical ideas. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, so 30 seconds. What do you want... What, 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 What's your mission right now for the national conversation? We know you've got your operation running smoothly. What is, what what, what do you want? I want national. I want I want us to be able to get the federal government to do what they need to do to help us keep the people in our community safe and help us fulfill our promise and not undermine it. That's what we should be doing. Um, I don't uh, I don't have any th any other agendas other than what matters to the people that elected me. Still love your job. Love my job. Good to see you. Nice to see you, Dan. The sure. sheriff. Final word when we come back. All right. Do you mind if we take a break tomorrow a little bit? March Madness is upon us. In fact, I think there's a couple of playing games tonight. I have to check my for amusement only pool sheet and uh, make a few picks. But Bill Koch, basketball writer for the Providence Journal and Red Sox writer, will join us tomorrow as we get an analysis and a breakdown. In case you need a little help, you know, with your amusement only decisions. We'll see you tomorrow on the radio 2 at 3 until 6 on WPRO. Good night.